All right, so in this section, we will first prove the so-called Skorohod's embedding theorem, which shows how to embed a random variable into a Brownian motion. And then we will use it to prove the law of the iterated logarithm for the sums of IID random variables. And this Skorohod's embedding will allow us to reduce that case to a much simpler case of the law of the iterated logarithm for the Brownian motion. Another application of this embedding will be given in the exercises where we will outline a different proof of the Donsker's theorem about the convergence of the random walk under appropriate rescaling to the Brownian motion. And throughout this section, WT will denote a Brownian motion and we will denote by Ft, a sigma algebra generated by a Brownian motion up to time t. And whenever we mention a stopping time in this section, it is always with respect to this particular sigma algebra. Now, before we prove the score of Hodge's embedding, we will need the following technical uh, result. Namely, if tau is a stopping time, with respect to the above sigma algebra, such that its expectation is finite, then when you look at the Brownian motion at this stopping time, its expectation will be zero, and the expectation of the square of this Brownian motion at the stopping time will be equal to the expectation of the stopping time. So it will also be finite. So in particular, this generalizes uh, this property of the Brownian motion for a fixed time to a, a stopping time, right? We know by definition that the variance of Brownian motion at time t is t, and here we get something of the same form for a stopping time. Now, the proof of this result consists of several steps, and here I will present only the first conceptual step. Namely, we'll consider the case when the stopping time takes finitely many values. Okay, so the, the main idea is really contained in this step and the following steps after that, which I will refer to the notes, they're basically reducing to this case first by some truncation argument and then by the standard discretization argument where you can discretize your stopping time by rounding up to dyadics. Now, in this case, we know that the Brownian motion at, at these finitely many times, with respect to this sequence of sigma algebras, this is a martingale, right? which of course just follows from the independence of the increments for the Brownian motion. Right? Namely, if you consider the expectation of the increment between time j plus 1 and time j conditionally on the sigma algebra at time j. This increment is actually independent of the sigma algebra, so the conditional expectation is just its expectation, so this is just zero. And on the other hand, w at that time tj is, is measurable on the sigma algebra, so this is the same as saying that conditional expectation at time j plus 1, conditional on the sigma algebra at time tj is just the value of the process at this time tj. So indeed it's a martingale. And not only it's martingale, but the stopping time tau here is, is finite, so in the optional stopping theorem, all the integrability conditions are obviously satisfied. And so, in particular, by the optional stopping theorem, we can conclude that the expectation of a Brownian motion at the stopping time is the same as the expectation of the Brownian motion at this time t1, which is zero, right? So that proves the first property above. And so we only need to prove the second equation, right? namely that this expectation of 
Brownian motion squared at this time is expectation of the stopping time. Okay, and this will be proved by induction on N. Well, namely, of course, when N is equal to 1, this is just the definition or par a part of the definition of the Brownian motion, that the expectation of the Brownian motion at a given time squared or its variance it's just that time which is of course just the expectation of this constant stopping time so the only thing we need to show is the induction step from n minus 1 to n now for this what we'll do is we'll just truncate the stopping time at tj minus 1 so we'll consider alpha to be the stopping time tau truncated at tj minus 1. So just taking a minimum of these two. And we know that this operation of truncation also gives you a stopping time. So it's a stopping time which takes n minus 1 values now. And so by induction assumption, we know that the expectation of the Brownian motion at this time squared is the expectation of alpha. And to compute the expectation of Brownian motion squared at time tau, okay, we'll just write it as W alpha plus the increment. Okay, and if you square this out, you get expectation of W alpha squared plus expectation of the increment squared plus twice the expectation of W alpha times the increment. Okay, and in the, the first term we, we already know by induction, so we just need to compute the second and third term here. The main observation is that alpha can only be not equal to this stopping time tau if this stopping time takes the largest value Tn in which case alpha is rounded or is truncated to be tn minus 1. For all other values that tau can take, alpha is equal to tau. Right? So in particular, their difference, the difference of the stopping time in those cases will be 0. Okay, so using this, we can write, for example, the second term above as the expectation, so the difference will be non-zero only when tau is Tn and alpha is Tn minus 1, and that happens on the indicator when tau is equal to Tn. And then we just notice here that tau is equal to Tn belongs to the sigma algebra actually up to time Tn minus 1. Right? Because actually the complement of, of this event tau equals to Tn is that tau is less than or equal to Tn minus 1. And this increment here is of course independent of that sigma algebra. It's independent. And so as a result this expectation can be written as a product of two expectations. The first one just gives you the increment of the time. And the second one is just this probability that tau is equal to Tn. The same thing for the last term. So if we want to compute this last term, we can restrict to the indicator as above. Okay, so alpha will be Tn minus 1 and tau will be Tn. when tau is equal to Tn. And again, this event, this last event we already know is in sigma algebra up to time Tn minus 1. And this first factor is measurable with respect to that sigma algebra. And this last factor is independent of that sigma algebra. And so this whole thing is actually zero. Okay, and so as a result, the expectation of w tau squared, it will be 
Okay, by induction, the first term is just expectation of alpha plus this increment of time times the probability that tau is equal to Tn. And because alpha is just a truncation of tau to time Tn minus 1, this first expectation will be a sum of Tj times the probability that tau is equal to Tj up to time n minus 2, right? And then the last two values, so in other words, when alpha takes value Tn minus 1, that happens when tau takes value either Tn minus 1 or Tn. So it's the sum of these two probabilities. Right? And then you see that when you add this last term, it will modify Tn minus 1 to become Tn on the probability when tau is equal to Tn. Okay, so this whole sum is just now an expectation of tau, and that's exactly what we wanted to prove. So this finishes the proof of this case with finitely many values, or when the stopping time takes finitely many values. And as I said, the rest is just by a straightforward reduction argument, which I will leave to the notes. Okay, and then using this result, we will now prove our first main result of this section, the so-called Skorohod embedding theorem, which states that if we have a random variable y, so if y is a random variable with expectation equal to zero and with finite second moment, then there exists a stopping time such that the distribution of the Brownian motion at that stopping time is the same as the distribution of this random variable. And of course, the, the stopping time that we will construct, it will be a proper stopping time, and in fact, its expectation will be finite. The, the proof of this result will proceed by some special discretization of this random variable y. And so, for convenience, we will suppose that if the distribution of this random va variable y is mu, then the random var variable itself is just the identity function on its sp sample space. So, in other words, on the real line with Borel sigma algebra and the probability measure given by mu. And before we'll describe this discretization, let's make a quick observation that will be used many times throughout the proof, namely that if the random variable takes two values, let's say minus a and b, for some positive a and b, then the fact that its expectation is equal to zero determines its distribution, okay, once you know these two values, right? So that's just because the expectation can be written as the probability of b times b plus the probability of minus a, which is 1 minus p times minus a, and because this is zero, you can compute the probability of b as a over a plus b. So whenever the random variable with mean zero takes two values, you automatically know what the probabilities are. And in particular, if our random variable indeed takes just two values, then we can define the stopping time in our theorem just to be the first time when our Brownian motion hits either level minus a or b. So in particular, the Brownian motion at that time will also take two values minus a and b, and so the distribution will be determined by these values as soon as we know that the expectation of 
the Brownian motion at that time is zero. It's a question mark, but this follows from the previous lemma as soon as we know that the expectation of the stopping time that we just defined is finite. And this follows by a straightforward observation, something very similar to what we have done for random walks before, namely the probability that the stopping time exceeds n can be bounded by the following event, that the fact that you haven't crossed one of these two levels, minus a and, and b, means that the increment between time j plus 1 and j was smaller than a plus b, for j starting from 0 up to n minus 1. But because these increments are all independent for the Brownian motion, this probability is just the probability that one such increment, let's say w1, is less than a plus b, and there are n factors there, so to the power n, so it's of the form gamma to the n for some gamma strictly less than 1. So the tail of this stopping time is geometrically small, so of course it implies that the expectation is finite. So in particular, by the previous theorem, we know that the expectation of the stopping time is zero, and this of course implies that the distribution of Brownian motion at the stopping time is the same as the distribution of this random variable y in the case when it takes just two values minus a and b. Okay, and for the general case, we will start with this discretization procedure for the random variable y, which will go as follows. Okay, so we are going to consider first the sequence of the increasing sequence of sigma algebras on the real line of the following uh, form. So we'll have some increasing, we'll construct some increasing sequence inside the Borel sigma algebra in the following specific way. Given this real line, the, the, the first sigma algebra will be generated just by two intervals, from minus infinity to zero and from zero to infinity. So B1 will be the sigma algebra consisting of an empty set, the whole space, and intervals from minus infinity to zero and from zero to infinity. Then at every step we are going to do the following. So whenever we have an infinite interval, we'll split it into an interval of length one and whatever the leftover infinite interval. So on this side it will be from minus infinity to minus one and from minus one to zero. So that will give us the sigma algebra B2. Now after that, again, whenever we have an infinite interval, we'll split it into an interval of length 1, so up to 2 on this side and up to minus 2 on this side, but every finite interval in the previous sigma algebra will be split in half. So this interval here will be split in half, and this interval here will be split in half. Okay, so more precisely, once you have Bn in the above construction, then you go to Bn plus 1 by splitting any finite interval into two intervals of equal length. So you split into intervals from C to C plus D over 2 and from c plus d over 2 up to d. And then the infinite interval, as I said before, you split the interval from some constant to infinity into the interval from this constant to c plus 1 and from c plus 1 to infinity and the same thing on the other side. So from minus infinity to some constant c 
you split it into minus infinity to c minus 1 and from c minus 1 to c. So that's the construction of the sigma algebras and let's notice that this sequence, this increasing sequence of sigma algebras, it converges, so it's increasing and it converges to the sigma algebra B infinity, which by definition is just sigma algebra generated by the union of all these sigma algebras. And in this particular case, that's going to be the Borel sigma algebra B on the real line. And that, that's clear because if you take any finite interval, you can see that in this construction, eventually all dyadic intervals will be included. So on any finite interval, it's just the sigma algebra generated by dyadic intervals, which we know is, is the Borel sigma algebra. So by this procedure, since we keep adding intervals on the left or on the right, eventually all finite intervals will be included. Okay, that, that will be important to us because now, given this construction, here will be the approximation of a random variable y. So we'll simply consider a martingale yj, which will be the expectation of this random variable y, conditionally on the sigma algebra bj we define above. And we'll discuss how these look like in a second, but what will be important to us is that by Levy convergence theorem for martingales, right, these yj converge to the expectation of conditional expectation of y given b plus infinity, but in this case it's the Borel sigma algebra, so that this is just y. So in other words, these yj's converge to y almost surely. And so, as a result, their distributions also converge. But, on the other hand, the sigma algebra bj for any fixed j consists of finitely many intervals, or is generated by finitely many intervals. And this yj is measurable on that sigma algebra bj, so it's just a step function. It has to take a constant value on each of these intervals. So yj as a function of x, well if the interval carries some weight then it's just the average value of your random variable y on that interval. So it's 1 over the probability of the interval cd, the integral over that interval of y, which is the identity with respect to this measure mu. Right? So for c or for x in this interval cd. And of course if the measure of a particular interval is zero, we can simply take any value on that interval and assign it to this random variable yj. Okay, so this random variable will be will satisfy all the properties of this conditional expectation of y given bj. And let us notice that if at some step we have some interval cd, again this could be an infinite interval, but here I'm just for certainty draw is as a finite interval. Right, so if this interval is in the sigma algebra bj, yj takes some value, let's say y in this interval by our construction. And then when we go to the next construction, go to the next step from j to j plus 1, right? what we did is we split this interval into two intervals. So in this finite case it's two, two equal intervals. And then we assign some value, let's say y1, on this first interval and y2 on this interval to this new random variable yj plus 1. So in other words, when you pick some particular value y that the random variable yj can take in our construction, so if yj takes some value y from the set of allowed values that we just constructed, 
right? This means that we are really on this interval CD where this value is. And in particular, yj plus 1 has to be on the same interval. So in other words, it's on one of these halves. So it can either take value y1 or y2 in this case. Moreover, as we said, this yj is a martingale. So in particular, the expectation of the increment yj plus 1 minus yj conditionally on the sigma algebra bj at the index j, right, because it's a martingale, this is 0. So the increment yj plus 1 minus yj has this conditional expectation equal to 0. And this will allow us to use this first step. So namely, it will allow us to write the following recursive formula for the distribution of a random variable yj plus 1. So if we want to know what's the probability that yj plus 1 takes some allowed value in our construction. So here let me take for certainty value y2. Right? So we choose some specific interval and some allowed value y2. Well first, as we said before, since this forces us to be on this interval, automatically we can add the condition that yj must take value y on this interval. So this is not really a, a new information once you know the value at time j plus 1. Now, if you rewrite this first event in terms of the increment, in other words, yj plus 1 minus yj must be equal to y2 minus y. And then also let me write it as a conditional probability given that yj is equal to y times the probability of the condition. This first conditional probability can be computed because we know that the conditional expectation of the increment is zero. So on this condition, yj equals to y, the increment can take only two values and the expectation is zero. The conditional expectation is zero. So by the same calculation as before, this will be equal to a over a plus b, where in this case, a is just y minus y1 and divided by y2 minus y1 is plays the role of a plus b okay, times the probability of yj equal to y. So in other words, we have this recursive formula that gives us the probability at any time in terms of the probability at previous time where the value at a previous time is split into two possible values here. Since they are on different interval, I can write that y1 is strictly less than y2. Okay, and so what remains is to mimic this construction somehow in terms of stopping times embedded into this Brownian motion. This will be done as follows. So we'll define stopping times tau n recursively in the following way. So first of all, at the first step, if the random variable y1 takes two values, minus a and b, so remember the first sigma algebra consists of two intervals, so y1 takes only two values, then as above, we just take tau1 to be the heating time of one of these values. Okay, and we already showed that indeed Brownian motion at this stopping time will have the same distribution as this random variable y1. Then given the stopping time tau j, we define the stopping time tau j plus 1 as follows. So if at the stopping time tau j our process takes one of these values y as above. So in other words, we fix a value y that the random variable yj can take. And so if our process takes that value, then on this event we define tau j plus 1 to be 
the first time after tau j such that the Brownian motion takes one of the values y1 or y2 okay so just like above whenever we split an interval into two at time j we had some possible value y on that interval which became one of the two values on each half right and so that's how we define the stopping time okay, so in other words these values y1 or y2 in the definition of the stopping time it de they depend on the value of our Brownian motion at the previous stopping time so it depends on in which interval we are at the previous stopping time but it's just cleaner to write it this way and then we'll see that by the strong Markov property of the Brownian motion we can actually calculate the probabilities of the Brownian motion at the stopping times by the, exactly the same recur recursive formula as above so namely if we want to calculate what is the probability that the Brownian motion at this stopping time tau j plus 1 takes one of the allowed values in this construction so again let me just fix a particular interval and choose a particular value let's say y2 again first of all this means that automatically we know what happened at the previous time so in other words if we choose y2 to be from a particular interval then we know that at time j the value of the process has to be in that in the previous interval that was split into two so it's this particular value y then we rewrite it in terms of the increment again okay and then let me maybe write this a little bit more explicitly how we can express the this first event here for the increment so more explicitly and also let me write probability as expectation of the indicator for a second so the fact that this increment here is equal to y 2 minus y really means that the increment process after time tau j so the process at time j plus increment h minus process at time j for h greater or equal than zero it hits level y2 minus y before y1 minus y of course times the indicator that we know that at time j we are at this value y coming from a particular interval but written in this form we can see now that this this first event of course belongs to the sigma algebra up to the stopping time tau j and this event here is it's an event of the form that our increment process after this time tau j it belongs to some particular fixed set in the space of continuous functions so this is written exactly in the form of the strong mark of property theorem for the brownian motion so in particular a strong mark of property of the brownian motion implies that we can write this as a product of expectations where in the first the first event can be now rewritten in terms of the brownian motion the increment after the stopping time has the same distribution as the Brownian motion so we can simply write this as the probability that the Brownian motion it's y2 minus y, y before y1 minus y okay, times the probability of the second event that w tau j is equal to y okay, so now we applied the strong Markov property and of course the first event is now of the same form as we have seen above that the Brownian motion hits one of the two values one is positive and, and one is negative so we already know what this is this is just y minus y1 divided by y2 minus one y1 times the probability that the process at time tau j was equal to one of one of these values that it can take okay but we see that it's exactly the same 
recursive equations as for the sequence yj, so we conclude that the distribution of the Brownian motion at this time tau j is the same as the distribution of yj. Moreover, we can also notice that all these stopping times have finite expectation because we can bound the stopping time tau n by the first time that our process reaches one of the two values minus a or b where minus a is just the smallest value that a random variable y n can take and plus b it's the largest value of, of y n. Right? If we see in this construction to reach the smallest and the largest value we have to pass through all the previous values for the previous random variables and so we can roughly bound the stopping time in this form so automatically from what we've seen be before we know that this expectation is finite for all n. Okay, once we know this we immediately have stronger infor information so moreover once we know that this expectation is finite we can now appeal to the previous theorem which says that the expectation of this stopping time is the expectation of the Brownian motion at that stopping time squared, which we already know is the same as the expectation of yn squared, since they have the same distribution. But yn was this right closed martingale, it was just expectation of y conditionally on the sigma algebra bn, and then by condition on conditional Jensen's inequality, this is bounded by the expectation of y squared, which is some finite number. So we know that the expectation of all these stopping times are uniformly bounded. And so finally, we'll simply take a limit of this stopping time times tau n, which is an increasing sequence. So increasing sequence converges almost surely to some limit, and the limit also will be a stopping time. And moreover, because this is a monotone limit, the expectation of the limit will be the limit of the expectations, okay, which are all bounded by the same constant. Okay, so the expectation of this limiting stopping time will be finite. And by continuity of our process of the Brownian motion, we know that we'll have almost sure convergence of the process at these stopping times. And also by the Levy convergence theorem above, we know that y ends converge to our random variable y almost surely. And so as a result, since we showed that the distribution of w at time tau n is the same as the distribution of y, at time n, and by almost sure convergence, this converge to the distributions of the limiting objects. This shows that the distribution of the Brownian motion at time tau is equal to the distribution of y. Okay, and so this finishes the proof of the Skorohod's embedding theorem.